All right, screencast number five in this relatively short unit. It's called long run costs. Now, I'll be honest with you. Um, long run costs are significantly less important than short run costs. Everything we've done up to this point have been about short run costs. That said, these are good for a few multiple questions on the AP exam and the occasional free response problem. So we're going to go through it. All right, let's talk about the long run. You'll remember that the short run is the time period in which something about your business is fixed. As long as you have at least one fixed cost, you're in the short run. So for example, again, the rent for a certain size factory. We've been looking at short run costs exclusively up to this point. In the long run, nothing is fixed. That's the definition of the long run. It's the time period, once, it's the time period that begins once you have no fixed costs. For example, you, um, the time period when you could have as big or small a factory size as you want. Maybe you sign a 10-year lease for a certain store space. Your short run is going to be 10 years long, but at the end of that lease, you could stay in the same store, you can move to a smaller store, you can get a bigger store. Now you're in the long run. Now, each different possible factory size, and I'm going to use factory size as a typical fixed cost, but we could be talking about other fixed costs. Each different possible factory size can be represented by a different short run average total cost curve. And you can plot out all those possible factory sizes. All those different average total cost curves um, can be graphed. So this was our graph that we were working with and we spent four screencasts getting to understand why this, what these curves are and why they look the way they do. They do. And when we drew this graph out, we were in the short run, which meant something was fixed. And again, here I'm assuming factory size. So that average total cost curve was for one particular size factory. Let's take that same average total cost curve and let's just place it in this graph. Maybe it was a small factory. Notice that the output level, the quantity relating to this factory is relatively small. Now this next curve might be the average total cost curve for a larger factory size. But you'll remember that in the long run, everything is variable. There's actually an in infinite, infinite, there's actually an infinite amount of possible factory sizes you can rent out. You can rent out 1,000 square feet, 1,001 square feet, 1,500 square feet, a million square feet, zero square feet. In the long run, everything's variable. So there's an infinite amount of possible factory sizes and they each have their own average total cost curve. I said infinite. That's better. All right, so each of those represent a different average total cost curve that might re um, relate to a different size factory. Now here's the upshot. The long run average total cost curve is simply going to envelope, hug along the bottom of all of the short run average total cost curves. And in fact, the long run average total cost curve is going to wind up looking like this. All right, so why is that? Let's talk about two specific factory sizes just to keep things simple. Let's say that I'm a business owner and I want to produce a certain quantity of output. Let's say Q. Now here we have two different size factories, the orangish yellow one and the red one. I'll call them ATC1, the average total cost curve for the orange factory. ATC2, the average total cost curve for a slightly larger factory. Now you'll notice that I can produce Q quantity using either of those two factories, the small orange one or the red larger one. Now if you look at the graph carefully, you should notice that if I had a choice between these two factories, I'd be better off picking the smaller orange factory. It would make sense to me because it would mean that my average total cost would be smaller using that factory size. You could see that in the graph. At this quantity, if I were to use the smaller orange factory, it says that my average total costs would be that much. If I were to produce the same quantity of output, this quantity using the larger red factory, this average total cost curve is saying that my average total cost would be higher. If I had a choice between those two factories, I'd rather produce whatever I'm producing at a lower average cost if I can.
Since I would never choose to operate in the larger red factory to produce that quantity, then this portion right here of this average total cost curve is kind of irrelevant. For any of these quantities, notice that this orange one, the smaller factory size, would give me lower costs. So it's kind of like I could just erase this part of this our, uh, larger red factory, this part of the curve, because it's kind of irrelevant. I would never choose to be in that factory. Same thing over here. Let's say I was produce, wanted to produce this quantity. If I went up, notice that the costs would be lower now for the red factory than they would be for the orange factory. And so I can kind of eliminate this portion of this curve because I would never choose to be in the smaller factory once my output goes beyond this amount. So back to all those infinite amounts of average total cost curves. If I were to simply just erase all of the portions of those curves that are irrelevant, because I would never choose to be in those factories, I would choose different ones, what I'd be left with is something that looks like this, the long run average total cost curve. All right, so now let's take that long run average total cost curve and talk about the different uh, portions of that curve. Here's our long run average total cost curve, and you'll notice that it goes down, bottoms out, and goes back up. Now in this first part of the curve, where long run average total costs, and again, we're talking about long run concepts here, we call this economies of scale. And what economies of scale means is that getting bigger means getting better or getting big, bigger lowers your cost of production. There's a very good reason that Honda can produce a car cheaper than I can produce a car. I just bought a Honda a couple years ago, it cost about $22,000. Now imagine that I wanted to produce that same exact Honda, but I wanted to do it myself. Think about how much it would cost me to produce it. I'm guessing that it would cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, for me to make a Honda in my garage that's exactly the same as the Honda that I bought. I have to go out and get specialized equipment that I'm only going to use for one car. I'm going to have to go back to school to learn electrical engineering, mechanics, welding, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to have to buy all the components. This car is going to cost me millions of dollars. It's going to take me probably 30 years to build. So look at an output of like one. Notice that the average cost would be really high. That's me producing a car in my garage. As output increases, as you produce more cars, the average cost of a car starts to drop. Honda can produce cars relatively cheaply because they buy these big machines and then the cost of those machines are divided over tens of thousands of units. My Honda that I'm building in my garage I had to buy that million dollar machine and only use it for one car. So the more you produce, at least initially, the lower the costs are. And again, we call that economies, economies of scale. Sometimes that's called increasing returns to the scale. And again, it means getting bigger means getting better. Now at some point, you reach some level of production where your costs don't change. Getting bigger doesn't help you anymore, but it also doesn't hurt you. That's called constant returns to the scale. This might be, for example, uh, clothing stores. You could have a relatively small clothing store, which might be here, that's selling shirts. And you might have a larger clothing store that's producing a higher output that's also selling shirts, and their costs might be pretty similar. Maybe costs don't change that much selling shirts in terms of changing the quantity. Now, at some point, you get so big that you enter the realm of what are called diseconomies of scale. Notice what's going on here. As your output increases, the cost of each unit you produce begins to go up. Now this is similar to the idea of diminishing marginal returns, but it's not exactly the same. Because diminishing marginal returns is a purely short-run concept. It's what happens when you add more and more of a variable resource to a fixed resource. Now in the long run, there are no fixed resources. That's the definition of the long run. But the explanation of diseconomies of scale is very similar. At some point, you get so big that you start to get unproductive. Think General Motors up until a few years ago. They were producing Oldsmobiles, Cutlass, uh, Chevys. They were producing Geos, Hummers. They were producing Buicks. They were producing Cadillacs. 
And each of those subdivisions had their own vice presidents and presidents. They were duplicating work. They each had their own advertising campaigns. Um, the company just got too big, too bloated, and inefficient. They started duplicating their management efforts. They started duplicating their advertising. They started having problems communicating among themselves within their company. And as a result of that, the cost of producing a GM car up until a few years ago was really high. That's why GM cars were so uh, non-competitive up until a couple of years ago. So we call that diseconomies of scale. I think General Motors. All right. Now this matters because it's going to kind of determine what an industry looks like. Let's take a long run average total cost curve that looks like this. Now notice that we get economies of scale up until very large units of output. In other words, this would be an industry where if you're a company, you need to be relatively large in order for you to be efficient, in order for you to be productive. Maybe like car companies or airline manufacturers need to be really large in order to, for them to be efficient and produce things at a low average total cost. So where there are extensive economies of scale, where you see economies of scale go on for long ranges of output, that tends to be an industry that's dominated by a few really big firms. On the other hand, what if the average total cost curve in the long run looked like this? Where you get economies of scale, but they run out pretty quickly and then you get diseconomies of scale going forward. If you're dealing with an industry where economies of scale are quickly exhausted, you're probably looking at an industry that has lots and lots of very small firms. Lemonade stands might be a good example of this. It's probably, it's probably the case that a very small lemonade stand would have a lower cost of producing each unit or each cup of lemonade than a gigantic lemonade stand would be. Right? You can picture a lemonade stand the size of a factory in the middle of downtown Minneapolis and what their cost of producing each unit of lemonade might be. They have to rent out lots of space. They have to incur all these costs. They're going to deal with miscommunication that you don't have to deal with as the sole proprietor of a very small lemonade stand. So where economies of scale are exhausted relatively quickly at relatively low levels of output, that's going to be an industry that's probably going to have lots and lots of very, very small firms. Now, one last concept before we go. Minimum efficient scale. Minimum, effic minimum efficient scale is the smallest output that a firm can produce while still getting to the very bottom of its average total cost curve in the long run. So if I were to show you this graph, we would call minimum efficient scale as happening right here where the arrow shows you. The first place as you move from left to right where we hit the very bottom of the average total cost curve. In other words, a business, if this was its long run average total cost curve, would want to produce at least this quantity of output in order to get its cost of production as low as it could possibly get it. All right, that wraps up this unit. Pretty theoretical, pretty graphical. More important in this unit is understanding why those short run cost curves look the way they do, but it's also useful and uh, useful on exams to understand long run costs as well. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh yeah!